Yes. Okay. All right, so um, a couple of, of notes and um, for our, if our guests can't see um, the chat, um, Jasmine is gonna send you some links that, um, that uh, are in the chat. Um, she's the one who's been communicating with you via Slack. So uh, this is the first of a series of professional development sessions that, that we have for um, our students who are working on projects in the summer uh, at SUNY Uniata. So some people are participating remotely, some are here on campus. Um, these four folks here are from our IGEM team and across the table is uh, someone from our anthropology department. So um, what we do each week is we have some type of professional development topic. Um, we're really excited to have our, our first ever non-campus related speaker um, with Lisa Weber. Um, and also each week, um, the purpose of this series is to try to help you get the most out of your applied learning experience. Um, and so the students who are physically here, uh, we've given journals to, and we're encouraging them to, uh, to spend a few minutes each week uh, writing about their experience. We have a series of prompts uh, to help you. Um, so it could be, you know, writing about a new technique that you learned or writing about your experience working with someone else. Um, and the goal is so that you have uh, more of a kind of contemporaneous record of your experience so that when you go for job interviews or when you're writing a cover letter or your resume or when you're trying to talk with someone about your work. Yeah, can you please admit? Um, what we want you to be able to do is have, you know, more concrete memories and be able to process your experience a little more. Um, so for those of you who are remote, um, I've made a website and I'm going to share the screen and show it to you now. So, uh, I'm going to share. Because this is share the mural. So, or is it it's going to be, you know, we're going to have to participate live. So, um, all right. So um, this is it's just a Google Sites. Uh, and again, for remote participants, Jasmine sending you the link. Uh, it has the link to uh, the Teams meeting for every week. Uh, it has the schedule and we're going to be posting recordings of all the sessions and any uh, handouts or resources. Uh, the other thing that this site has is it does have a subsite um, to, and of course, let's see, I don't think I uh, think I need to add a link. Nope. Yeah, it, <laughs> I'll go back. All right, I will add a link. There's a subsite that, um, has uh, the prompts for journaling if you want to do it along with us. And you know what? I just realized you can get there if you go to the top corner, the journal entry prompts. There they are. OK, so um, hopefully you find that information helpful. And I'm going to unshare my screen. And we are going to. Uh, we are going to get started. Um, so I'm going to give a quick introduction to our speaker, and then we're going to let her tell us about project management. Uh, so Lisa Weber is out on the west coast of the of the U.S., and she works for a consulting firm that, um, and she's working for Microsoft now, doing some project management. She's worked in the educational publishing industry. Um, there's a lot of scientists uh, in this room right now and, and watching around uh, around the world. Um, Lisa is not a scientist. She's got a BA in literature, um, but she is also an amateur scientist. Um, she does, does a lot of birding and some citizen science. So uh, she also works with scientists, helping them be a little more organized and actually uh, get their prog their um, projects efficiently completed. So um, thank you very much, Lisa, for agreeing to do this for us and uh, take it away. 
Okay. I'm so happy to be here. Hello, international audience. I am going to share my screen and make it the right size for you. And hope that Teams does what I want it to do. There you go. OK, yes, I'm here in my home office near Seattle, Washington, uh, right near Microsoft. The sun is shining and the birds are singing. So I'm, I'm just thrilled to be here to talk about how to make projects work. I'm going to give you a project management toolkit to get started, and I hope you, that'll give you practical advice that you can use in your project starting today and also help you decide whether you might want to go into the great discipline of project management. I am going to prov uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I don't want to say that on this slide. I'm going to tell <laughs> okay. here's the agenda. <laughs> you know what? We're actually I can't see your slides. Um, oh, don't tell me that. All right. See. Let's see what's happening. Just a second. Try again. Thanks for stopping me. Now we can see now we can see your slides. So. All right, but we're going to see them in a better view. Yeah. All Perfect. right, now we're good to go. OK, great. So uh, we've arrived at slide two, which is the agenda. We're going to do some quick housekeeping. I'll tell you a little bit more about what I'm doing at Microsoft and how I got there. I'll define the terms. We'll look at our dining hall case study and the framework of project management. What happens when project management goes wrong? <clears throat> and the typical tools that we use. And then we'll move over to career tracks and salary. And finally, I'll share with you the tricks of the trade that I've learned in my career as a project manager. So we're here for you. Please interrupt uh, since I can't see the chat. Um, we have people that will help me with that, but I'm going to be asking questions. Please come off mute if you'd like to ask questions. Uh, and I'm go don't worry about taking notes because I'm going to give you a handout and a PDF of these slides. And finally, I may address you as project managers. I think you already are. You've been working on projects in a high school, collaborative projects with a team of people, I'll bet. And your work, you're working right now on an amazing project for iGEM, some of you. And I wish you the best in that, those endeavors. So at Microsoft has a worldwide learning group. And my superpower because you need a superpower in project management. There's a lot of us, and it's really great to have something that distinguishes you from the rest of the project managers in the world, is that I love to work with blue sky thinkers who have tons and tons of ideas. They write them on the back of napkins. They move on to the next big idea, and they need some help with getting things done. They need someone who's interested in making things operational. So I, when I came out of college as an English literature major. I went to work for a college textbook publisher where I learned how to make 500 page science books with thousands of images, which you have to manage each of those images. And then I went over to the digital side of things where I really flourished and kind of honed my project management craft. And that's where I met my friend, Professor Bill Vining. And that's how I wound up talking to you. But when I moved to Seattle, I had three consulting roles at Microsoft. I spent some time at an educational nonprofit and then came back to Microsoft. So the, the team I'm working with at Microsoft are trying to get the world skilled up on Microsoft projects, products by containing creating training plans for employees to take Microsoft courses, hands-on lab sessions, et cetera. So that's what, what I do on an everyday basis. First, I'm going to define the terms. Um, so you already have a working knowledge of what a project is. And of course, you know that every project, especially the ones in Silicon Valley, are exist to make the world a better place. We're trying to add value. They also have a defined beginning and end, and they're about making a product, service, or result. And all projects have these three constraints, uh, budget, time, and scope. Scope is the work that needs to be done to complete a project. Nobody has unlimited time. Nobody has unlimited budget. So, and hopefully the, the scope is not unlimited, but the job of the 
project manager is to manage balance these three constraints and still have a quality output at the end. And it might seem like any logical person can manage a project. It's actually a discipline with professional certification and standards for executing the project lifecycle. Some projects are more formal than others and follow the standards more closely. I had a manager once who said, we do project management light here. And for me, that's what I prefer. There's very rigorous project management, let's say in, uh, in, in other disciplines that are more exacting. But when it comes right down to it, project managers take the responsibility for who, what, when, where, why, and how, and they make sure that everything gets done on time, on budget, and to that high quality standard. You've got examples of everyday project management all around you from the posts on social media that you make. Those involve art directing and stage managing sometimes. There are many projects. Your coursework, of course, baking bread during the pandemic. How about moving? That's on the top of the most stressful list for most people because it takes a specific type of person to see moving as a project to be organized. Same with weddings. This is why we have wedding planners. And of course, student and political activism that moves our society forward. So I say that project management is the engine that connects everything in our world in all different domains, from construction to technology to research and government. Every building that gets built, every drug that gets approved by the FDA, every government project, budget is a project. So I think I... Uh, what else do I want to say on this slide? We're going to move to our dining hall case study, and I'm going to turn this over to Kelly or Jill to talk about our problem statement and the brainstorm question. OK, um, so when Lisa and I were talking about what we wanted to do with this session, we thought it would be a good thing to have you guys actually sort of participate in some of the aspects of project management. So we wanted to come up with a case study. And we were trying to think of something that was kind of small, but but you know you could would be relevant to to everyone. And um, so this issue that came to mind for me, we had talked about you know big political things like global warming, and then and then we kind of tried to make it smaller. And there was a student at SUNY Indiana who was who was uh, associated with the chemistry department in one way. Um, and he was an observant Muslim, and there are not many on our campus, uh, but our dining food does have um, halal options for students. Uh, but during Ramadan, this student mentioned that, um, the, that the dining halls closed before uh, the breaking of the fast. So, you know, he couldn't eat um, unless he, he planned. Um, so we thought, you know, there might be, you know, other ways in which the dining halls fail students, you know, dietary needs or, you know, fit, does, not, does not fit into their lifestyles. So we thought um, of the issue that we could take on is, you know, do campus dining services adequately meet the dietary needs of a wide variety of students? Um, and how can we make sure um, and, and what can students do to communicate with dining services to make sure everyone is accommodated. So that's the little issue that we're going to tackle in our brainstorming session. Um, and I'll send it back to Lisa. All right, so I'm going to put this brainstorm question into a virtual collaboration platform called Mural. And we're going to go there right now and brainstorm on what we could do to spin up this project at SUNY Oneonta. Um, and Kelly's gonna put the link in the chat for how to join, and I'm gonna show you what you should see when you join. Yes. And you'll have the option to enter as guest. Choose that option, please. Okay. Now, what we're gonna do here is actually a requirements gathering session. And I'll show you where that fits in to the project management life cycle in just a minute. All right. Do you guys have the mural link? Yep. All right. So this is what you should see 
when you get here. I see people joining. This is awesome. All right. So in my view, I have this outline that lets me run around in the in the view. Here's the this is a template that Mural provides, and then I customized it just a little bit to get us going. So brainstorming, of course, let's look at the rules. Pay attention particularly to number one, two and seven. Get those wild ideas. Do not have any judgment on anybody or yourself and just get as many as you can. And it can be difficult to navigate around in the mural. So if you have this outline open, the way to get to the outline is to click this little guy here up in the top right corner. I hope you can still see my screen. Oh, and mural doesn't work on um, mobile devices. Sorry about that. But here's our question. So there's our campus dining services adequately meeting the dietary needs of a diverse population. How can we ensure that everyone is accommodated? So then you can either click solo brainstorm to get to the little sticky notes, or you can mess around with the scroll bars and the zoom down in the bottom right corner here and make it just a little bit bigger for yourself and start writing your ideas. Just double click into any anywhere and I'm going to give you four minutes. Just double click to any sticky note. And let's see, how would we get how would we spin this up? And then we're going to organize those notes. So I'm starting the timer now. This is called time boxing when you give somebody a timed exercise like this and it's meant to promote a little bit of a sense of urgency and like just get it out there, get it done. And if your sticky note needs to be bigger because you've got a lot of text on it, you can drag it down to this bottom part here and resize it to make it bigger. This is awesome, thank you. It's all happening. I'm watching a video game. Yeah, you can't break this, so don't worry. <laughs> I'm going to move this one down here because it's a ah, very good. For that purple one, visiting sea turtle, drag that down to the, the bottom and make it a little bigger so we can read it. Good job. Keep going a little further. Good. That's great. Think about how you're going to present these ideas and who you might present them to. We got a minute left. A 
Well done. This is great. Wonderful. <clears throat> Yes, yes, yes. These are all wonderful ideas. Thank you. So the idea here is that before COVID and before there was so much remote work, teams would get together and do these sticky notes on the wall. And then they would arrange them into work streams that are sort of like milestones in the project. And so you might have a milestone for raising awareness around campus, maybe a milestone for collecting information with the survey idea, which is awesome. Uh, and, and you might have a schedule and you might have a budget for this kind of a project. Um, so this gives you an idea of how people collaborate when it comes to project management and how you can pull people in and make sure that you're capturing a diversity of ideas. And I think uh, I'm going to ask you questions about this case study as we go. And I'm also going to show you a little bit more about Mural. First of all, you can export this. So if you did, it can come out in a PDF file and then you would have this on hand for you to organize your project and write your project plan. That's where these kinds of this, this is requirements gathering and they go into the very first document in the project management life cycle, which is the project plan. But before I leave mural, I'm just going to show you there are tons of templates in here for all different exercises that people do together. That one happened to be uh, made by Meta or formerly known as Facebook and um, the rest of these are by all kinds of different companies that have put things in here. Um, so it's a great tool and I'd definitely recommend it. So going back to my presentation. Let's see. Thanks for doing that. That's awesome. I'm going to show you where that fits into the uh, project management framework. First and foremost are people. People first. Managing and communicating well with people is foundational to any team. Of course, there's a project manager and many organizations <coughs> have project sponsors and then the team members. But in the corporate and nonprofit world, most, proje most projects have sponsors. It, they're usually the strategist at the organization who is higher up in the organization than the project manager, and they're ultimately responsible for the success of the project. The project manager handles the day to day details and does not report to the project sponsor usually. So it's kind of an interesting relationship. We we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But there are two things to that are really important to do right up front with a team to help make it a smooth running team. Define the roles and the escalation path. I was on a team once where we forgot to define the roles and responsibilities because we were trying out a new software development framework. And this led to like duplication of effort and then a lot of resentment among team members. So we definitely do not want that. The escalation path defines who you'll talk with if the high level decisions need to be made about the future of the project. Now for the documents. Project management is very document dependent, dependent, and the first document that you make is the project plan. It captures the project's requirements and milestones. So now you see where what we just did fits in. Then comes the budget and the schedule. Sometimes you're given a budget to work with, and sometimes you're given a scheduled date that you must meet, sometimes both. In the risk log and the decision log, you keep track of major risks as they pop up and major decisions that are made throughout the project. And many projects require the project manager or team members to document process throughout the project. And I was excited to hear Kelly talking about you keeping a journal because that is documenting process and it's really important. And then there are the meetings. We always start with a kickoff meeting with the whole team where you discuss 
the project plan. Sometimes requirements gathering comes after the kickoff to flesh out the project plan. And then we start holding status meetings on a weekly or biweekly cadence. At Microsoft, fun fact, meetings that recur like that are called the rhythm of business. Microsoft has all kinds of funny names for things that I, I kind of collect them. That's my favorite thing to do. And at the end of the project, you hold a retrospective meeting where you close out the project formally and talk about the lessons learned. So next we're going to look at a schedule example. This one is about constructing a house. The milestones are in the blue shaded rows with the tasks below the milestones. So if you're using like fancy project management software like Smartsheet or Microsoft Projects, you can enter the duration of each task in this column and the number of day, days it'll take to complete, that's the duration. And then the other dates will populate automatically. It's so wonderful. But if you don't like the end date, then you adjust the durations to get to the right end date. And if you're using Excel instead, then you would use formulas to get a similar result. And then because you spend your time tracking progress against the schedule, you'll also enter the actual dates against these planned dates. There's one other way to see a schedule. This is a Gantt chart here on the right. It's a visual representation of the schedule. Microsoft, a project, Excel, and Smartsheet can all produce Gantt charts from schedule data. It helps project managers identify dependencies between tasks, such as needing the foundation to be completed before the electrical and plumbing. And also, visualization tools like this help project sponsors and executive teams see where you are at a glance. And this is really important for managing up. Soft skills. Project management as a discipline has been around for a long time, but in recent years we've seen a new emphasis on soft skills. I think this is, you know, coming throughout our society. Um, it's all about how to build relationships and foster empathy, trust, and psychological safety on your team. In fact, in the nonprofit where I worked, psychological safety was part of the organization's mission statement. It didn't necessarily play out in real life that way, but that's what we, they were aiming for. One of the best ways to learn how to manage teams is to study personality types. You can choose from a lot of different personality frameworks. Maybe you've taken the Myers-Briggs inventory. That's a famous one. And you know already know what your four letters are. I'm I am an INFP. Frameworks are great. And I also think that having a great conver a direct conversation is one of the best methods for finding out how someone likes to work. Uh, you won't always be able to accommodate all preferences, but it's really good to have the conversation and hear the people out and start building that relationship. And there's a new trend for people to write user manuals about their preferences, and then they share the user manuals with the team. So a user manual tells you how you like to, how you like people to work with you. So project management is all about collaborating with people and persuading them to do work, even though you don't manage them directly. And this is called influencing without authority. And to make it even spicier, People on the teams are often cross-functional. They come from various parts of the organization and each of them have their own perspectives and priorities. Time, like for instance, on one of, when I was working for the educational publisher, I counted 12 different functionalities that were going on in our team from editors, proofreaders, software developers, interaction designers, it was amazing and everyone was necessary and important to the team. Time management is an often overlooked soft skill and very important for college as you're finding out. <laughs> so look at these pre-populated entries for how to work with other people. This is a Google search. Um, I promise this is not my search history, but it gives you an idea of how widespread this issue is about how to work with other people. 
So here's my first question for you. How will soft skills be needed in our case study? Here's where I need help with the chat or people to All right. mute. So we have a microphone in the room and we're on. Lisa, can you hear us? Yeah, All right. thanks. So folks in this room can answer by speaking or you can type in the chat. So how, will, how do you think soft skills would be needed in the case study about the dining halls? You think? Like here's a prompt for you. If you're going to meet with the campus administrators, how do you think they might like to receive requests for change from students? So in there, you're trying to demonstrate empathy for how an administrator thinks. What do you think? Petitions. Petitions. If we have a significant group of students on campus that want our observant, observant Muslims to have access to food passing time fast, then it's not only showing that, it's showing the support of this community for our own community members. And I think that's something that the administration at Oneonta would like to see. So, so yeah, Jasmine, that's so that's definitely from their perspective, they want to see that it's more than one person that cares about this, right? Yeah. So and they might want a written proposal, more effective than a verbal one. Yeah. Just because they might need to pass it around, they might need to meet it with it about it, you know, without you being there. Uh, so there are that's some ideas that we've got for this case study. Excellent. I put together this little thing. So you might be a project manager if you like to plan and organize and you make a lot of lists and checklists. You document decisions in your journal. You wrote up a plan to get to college if you, or if you've used a spreadsheet to budget and you've ever spent time thinking about how, what can I plan ahead to, to make future me happy and you've really got the time management system down or you could just summarize the whole thing by whether you're the oldest child because oldest children like me <laughs> often want to take responsibility and are there any with... oldest children in the room <laughs> oh i'm half the room <laughs> yeah so you want to be recognized for that excellent i love that <laughs> I'm any other babies? Yeah, yep. me and Liam <laughs> and William. <laughs> well, sometimes it begins again as you with the baby. The baby actually exhibits some oldest child things. <laughs> All right, so here are some famous projects that have gone wrong in recent years. Um, of course, I live in Boeing country and Boeing 737 MAX airplane crashes were horrible. And those happened in the last couple of years, resulted in 20 months of Boeing airplanes being grounded at a huge cost to the company, massive project management failure, and then a new project, PR project to handle the disaster. Um, so also the deep water horizon oil spill in 2010, ecological disaster for the Gulf Coast waters and the people who live there, animals, birds. Here's one that's a little less toxic. In 2014, France paid $20 billion, the equivalent of that, to buy 2,000 new commu commuter trains, but the trains were almost eight inches too wide for the stations in the regions and they had to spend another 70 million dollars to retrofit all the stations big mistake how about, the, how about the fire festival coming soon to netflix uh the greatest party that never happened yeah we remember that but do you recall the segue it was going to take the world by storm it had so much hype around it and now it's kind of something that mall cops ride around on <laughs> So here's the typical causes of project management failures, and you can probably guess at the first set of them. You know, when things go wrong with stakeholders, gathering requirements, 
not addressing risks, letting cost and schedule overruns go crazy, and not controlling the scope. There's something called scope creep, where just more and more work just keeps on getting piled into the project that, that was not initially accounted for. So these are all problematic things. But there's also poor product design, and sometimes executives just withdraw their support in the organization, and then the project just flops. And some projects really need change management as a component, which is uh, uh, communicating and educating the people who are going to be dealing with the change. And because you need to be able to help them accept the change, you have to teach them how to accept it. Lisa? Yeah. I have a question. So with, with respect to the change management, is it an issue of the from the project manager's point of view? Is it the project manager's job to do that communicating and dealing with the change or just making sure someone else does it? Yeah, I would say it's definitely getting someone else to do it unless you're in an organization where you wear a lot of different hats. But there are I'm working with a change management lead person right now at Microsoft, and that's the first time I've ever had a dedicated person to do change management for me. Cool, so it depends on the size of the organization, but there are definitely people and that's a discipline in and of itself and has its own certifications. Good question. Lisa, I have another question um, yeah. and it's related to scope. Um, so one of the things that our iGEM team has talked about is we brainstorm tons of ideas. We've talked about, you know, what can we reasonably get done? Uh, can you Tell us a little bit about um, about what stages in you know in the kind of corporate corporate world like what at what stages does the scope of a project get changed? Well, it's it's usually it's usually the the ideal is to have the scope defined from the beginning, and that might require a, a section in the project plan that talks about what is out of scope. There's a concept in in project development called um, minimum viable product. Sometimes you the first phase, the first thing that you release is not perfect. You you're you're putting it out there and then you plan to iterate on it in future phases. So you have to get people to accept that you might not be able to get everything done right in the first part of the project. Um, and by the first part of the project, I mean the first project, because the next phase would be a new project. So um, there's another phrase, it's called kill your darlings. So people can get really attached to scope and it really requires uh, some, some strong management, hopefully by the project sponsor. If, if the project sponsor doesn't have any notion of how to curb the scope, then uh, the project manager is kind of at the project sponsor's mercy. But you can always keep asking questions as the project manager and try to help people work through the implications of a scope that is too big. Thanks. You're welcome. I was uh, wondering what might cause our case study to be unsuccessful. I suppose you could experience a lack of executive support if you find that the campus administration isn't open to even meeting with you to talk about changes, or if you held a rally and only three people showed up. So <laughs> for these for these for these potential failures, you might consider contingency plans. Those would be kind of fall into the risk column. Any other ideas on what might cause it to be unsuccessful? OK, I'm going to move to the typical tools that we use. Of course, Word for me is the gold standard for collaborating with more than one person in, on a document because you can see track changes and track changes in Word is always best in the Word app instead of the Word browser, uh, Word in the browser. So that would be, that's my recommendation. Always use the Word app and since the project plan is the first document to be made, that's usually where you start, followed closely by Excel for schedules, budgets, 
decision and risk logs. And this is that actually the preferred project management tool at Microsoft, even though Microsoft has its own project management software. Honestly, nobody uses it. It's incredible. <laughs> it's really funny to me. Um, I know that you have a wiki, which is awesome because the idea is to have a to have a single source of information for your team. Um, we call it the single source of truth. And uh, this is a, because as a project manager, you're going to be in those documents every day, but other people on the team will dip in and dip out and they just need to find, go to one place where they can find a link to the project plan, a link to the budget and a link to all the other things. It's and so I use OneNote, which is another Microsoft thing. It's like if Word and Excel had a baby, this is what OneNote is. There are tabs across the top of the pages and within each of the tabs, I'm sorry, the tabs across the top of your view and each of the tabs you can have pages in it. So you can really segment the information maybe by the milestones in your project and helps you organize it in a way that makes sense for the project. And then you just have one document to search, the OneNote notebook, and you can put that into OneDrive and share it with your team. Um, so I heard you mention Slack, which is great. Teams are Slack for instant messaging. We need those. And of course, Twitter and WhatsApp have been used to organize all kinds of social activism. Maybe you have a campus system for that, but like I'm thinking of the Arab Spring and Occupy Wall Street. Ah, uh, and then I'm going to go. The, here are the advanced tools. So I mentioned Microsoft Project and Smartsheet, which are like Excel on steroids, and they manage dependencies and build those schedules automatically. And then in the software development world, we have ticketing systems that are really a part of project management. Uh, in Microsoft, we have Azure DevOps, and a lot of the rest of the world uses Jira. And so if you are a software developer, you go get your tickets that are assigned to you at the beginning of each two week sprint, and then you do your work uh, in the programming arena and you come back to the system, the ticket to communicate with people and to say, all right, I'm done with this. Now it's ready to go to the next step, which is probably some kind of a review step, uh, QA step. So um, this, it's an, and, and you can actually pull those tickets into your schedule if you're using Smartsheet or Microsoft Project. So it, that's how you can track through the scope of software development work. There's also a specific project management software, and I will recommend Monday.com because people seem to love it. But there's also some funky ones to stay away from. Just make sure that whatever you try has been reviewed well by other people. <laughs> So what do you think? What tools might be useful for our case study? I left email off here because uh, there's some, there's, there's, there's kind of going away from email in some ways, you know, with Teams and Slack, but um, it's still a big organizing tool. Slack. Just because I know that it's going to have to itself as a Slack um, and they have like a whole like page just dedicated to people in Oyanta, I believe, excuse me. So I feel like people join that, it would be very much like, like right on. the word out more and having like a rally virtually yeah. rather than having like. So, so, how, so do, do you know many students who use Slack? Like if you wanted to, if you wanted to list other students know on campus that there was this issue that you were trying to get support for, what's the thing that you would use to communicate with them like that would come to mind first? Probably Instagram. Yeah, so so social media, Instagram. So even I just point that into Excel, so the campus, the administration has a visual number of how many feedback from that. So to actually see the feedback. Yeah. Yeah. Change.org. <laughs> yep. Yep. Great. 
great. And you might also even use Word to create posters or banners that you could print at the local print shop. So let's turn now to project management careers. That you can configure project management work in a variety of ways. Uh, it can be full time, um, a consulting contract like I have, you can be on site or remote. So I have been working on contracts and at home for the last five years. It's definitely possible to make authentic relationships and develop then to develop the trust of a team and to lead people from a remote environment. And you'll find that as you start getting into reading job descriptions, I see you have a resume prep workshop coming up that project management skills are valued by many people who hire uh, non-project management roles. In fact, I've never had the title project manager. It's just embedded into everything that I've done. For example, uh, at the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation in Seattle, they, they put out a lot of COVID data and visualizations. The project managers are called project officers. And Microsoft, only has project manager program managers. They just there just aren't any project managers. They decided there's no difference between the two or that we don't need to differentiate between the two and that's it. But not everybody agrees with that approach. So here's the first track. The entry level point is uh, as a coordinator or an assistant role. You'd look for a project coordinator, research coordinator. I started as an editorial assistant and the project management office is, is found in organizations that are large enough to have a number of project managers and they report into the project manager office. And over time, then you would be promoted to project manager and then senior project manager taking on more responsibility, more complexity over time. And then you would, at some point, you could be in line for the director of the project management office or even a vice president. For track two, this is uh, this starts with the project manager who is the responsible for a specific project. And you can think of project management as very tactical. And then on the next rung of the letter would be program manager, where you'd have multiple related projects and you're starting to think in a strategic way now in a way that directs the, the organization's um, uh, future. And portfolio manager will be taking care of all programs and projects, and that's the most strategic um, role. And you'll notice that all of these are abbreviated as PM, so it gets super confusing. You can't use abbreviations when you talk about these. And there's one more PM. You could hop over at any time after you're a project manager into product manager. If you've heard Amazon say that they're customer obsessed, these are the people that are doing the obsessions. Uh, they are working on product research to understand customer needs. They are the keepers of the vision of the product and they have a roadmap, which is kind of a wish list of work that they want to get done. They spend time prioritizing that on a weekly basis and coming up with uh, the tickets that the software developers will work on for two weeks at a time. They validate the business model and they also identify what success means to the particular product. That's a cool Lisa, job. Yeah, Lisa, can I ask the students a question? If, Please. Yeah. So iGEM team, um, and this, this is more specific for iGEM teams, uh, can you see in, in these kind of different roles how they would fit into an iGEM project? Because so because for for me, uh, the, the project manager would be like somebody who's taking care of like a technical aspect of something you're doing in the lab, right? Uh, who would be the pro portfolio manager, do you think? <laughs> no, not Jasmine. <laughs> I, 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 I'm thinking more like the person who is like point person for the wiki, right? Um, and then you know, and then this the strategic role would be what tasks are we going to choose to do if we're going after certain metals, right? Um, 
But um, and the product manager, if, if that's the person who's obsessing over over stakeholder needs, you know, that might be your human practices leader kind of. Um, but but yes, Jad, Jasmine would be would be managing a lot. <laughs> Great question. <laughs> <I'm about. laughs> All right, so how much can you get paid? <laughs> I've referred a couple times uh, to certification. So let's just look at salaries without certification. I am not certified. So uh, in my mind, these two <coughs> salary uh, amounts here, 115,000 a year or 77,000 a year, the reality probably is in between these two somewhere. That's been my experience anyway. One of the sources of the, of the higher number is the Project Management Institute, and they are the professional organization that gives out the certifications. And uh, the, the second one here is the Bureau of Labor Statistics. With certification, the Project Management Institute says you can command $25,000 more in salary. So, um, and they also put out this statistic about how many project managers are needed over in the near future by 2027, 88 million. So the outlook is, is bright that, you're, that you can get a project manager role. Lisa, how, how yeah. um, with, with respect to the different kind of levels of hierarchy that you had, mm -hmm how how hard is it to move from like one position to another position in a different air like a different kind of product so you're doing say like you're doing apple watches and now you're going to move and you're going to be doing you know toasters or whatever i don't know yeah no no i think it's a great project problem um I think within technology, it's not hard at all to be uh, to move from one type of technology to another. Uh, it might be people do tend to specialize in either the hard side or the soft side. So a toaster would be a, a piece of hardware, and um, you, it's not unheard of. I I knew of one woman who was coming out of cosmetology and trying to get into project management, and she was able to make the case and and do it. So it is, but I, I think it's pretty fungible. Uh, you just have to be able to talk about it. You have to have your story together and give your elevator pitch, and then be able to relate what you know to what the company or organization needs and oh, show thanks. how you would provide value. Good, yeah. thank you. You're welcome. All right, so here's what a little bit more about getting certified. So it's the Project Management Institute or PMI and the name of the certification is Project Management Professional. They have a book, the Book of Knowledge and it's quite rigorous and it requires you to document completed projects. So you should, you have to do this after you've had a couple of years of experience as a project manager and have completed some projects that you can put in there. Then you pay money to take an exam and you pass it. And then you apply to roles that require PMI certified PMP. And there are lots of training courses around to help you um, study for the test. And it's definitely better to do this with somebody as a study buddy. And there is a, a few other certifications that PMI offers, an entry level kind of associate certification for project management. And so then I, I think there must not be much documentation required of projects for that one. And then there's Agile, which is um, a whole different thing. Uh, for software development. And you're go I've given you some links that you can look through that on the handout. All right, we're totally come to the end and we have five minutes left, so this is great. These are the tricks of the trade that I've learned in my 25 years as a project manager. <laughs> Number one, this is like this, the, the most valuable thing I can tell you. Respond, be responsive to all requests and questions. And if you accept the best practice of a 24 hour turnaround for all requests and questions, then, and you need more time to fully respond, get to, back to the person on the day you receive it and say when, I'll respond on Wednesday. 
never believe never be the black hole of no response. It's a really a bad thing. You want to be that person that, th that other people can find. On the topic of communication, remember that no news is good news does not work for a project management in the absence. People just definitely assume the worst when there's no communication, so you have to develop the stamina to deliver bad news promptly and engage the team members in problem solving as soon as there's an issue to fix. And communicating deadline changes as far in advance as possible, don't want to surprise anybody. Something's always going to slip in a project. The deadlines are going to move around, even if you've put cushion into the schedule to account for slip slippage and you learn to mitigate and plan contingencies. This is a the next one is a big part of, of project management and it's why they call it hurting cats. It's because you do a lot of follow up to remind stakeholders of due dates for deliverables that are coming up in the schedule, so you'll start many emails with this is your friendly reminder for and digging in a little deeper into personalities you're not only going to learn about the personality frameworks but you're also going to learn about yourself which is really important you'll learn this influencing without authority thing when i first saw a professional development course on this i had no idea what it was about so this, this is a very tricky art of building trust in a team when you do not manage somebody, but you need them to do work for you. You have to have them buy into the spirit of the project and really feel like the team effort is giving them life. And along the lines of the project manager and the project sponsor working together, this is all about managing up. If you invest the time in finding out what your sponsor's communication preferences are, what's important to them, where this project fits into all their other priorities, it'll definitely pay off for you. And if by chance this relationship goes bad, my advice is to think about moving on. I have learned that some personality clashes just can't be fixed. I used to think you could fix anything, and now I've come around to understanding it is what it is and what that means. I never used to understand that, and sometimes that means moving on. And if your project requires documentation, please don't wait to the end of the project to put it together. You've got to document as you go, and that'll give you what you need to look for ways to improve the process. You can improve anything as you go, and process improvement is a big piece of project management and will really make you a valued member of the organization. Honestly, students, I did not pay her to say that. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, did not, we did not collaborate on this. <laughs> I think I missed uh, get stakeholders to buy into the schedule from the beginning. And the way that you can do that is to ask them to guesstimate how long they need to do something. And, and, and so they feel like they've had input into a realistic assessment of how long something takes. Um, like for example, in our case study, you'd ask people, how long would it take you to make some signs for a demonstration to, to raise awareness about this issue? All right, last slide. You're going to be consulting your calendar on a daily, sometimes hourly basis, and you can also use the calendar to help you get things done. Um, for instance, yesterday I, a coworker agreed to give me a deliverable on Wednesday, and I went right into my own calendar to make a private appointment for me, which is also known as a tickler that will pop up and remind me to check with her on Tuesday afternoon to make sure she's on track for Wednesday. Here's some meeting strategies, especially for the kickoff meeting. You have to really prepare and set enough time, set aside enough time to hold a robust meeting where you discuss the project in depth and um, get agreement from all the stakeholders on the scope of work and the project plan. This is where you can invest the time on that scope issue that will hopefully pay off dividends in a smooth running project. Then you can move on to regular status meetings, which are usually 
weekly or twice a month, you'll be the one providing notes, which is a real dance to do when you might also be the person who's facilitating the meeting. Taking notes and facilitating, no joke. And time boxing, which is the, what we did when I said you've got four minutes, it's another big productivity tool for project managers. It means you don't have unlimited time to do things. You let people know about it and you set that as an expectation throughout the project. So uh, it also means having time estimates on the for each topic on the agenda that you send out ahead of time for your meetings and that you're the timekeeper where you give people a heads up on the time left for their particular agenda item if they're presenting for you. And finally, if a sponsor tries to tip you over in a meeting with a curveball, such as moving up the due date for the end of the project or changing the budget by taking away thousands and thousands of dollars and asks you to commit on the spot to these changes, and this has happened to me, please say that you'd like to think it over and that you will respond on Wednesday. Don't commit on the spot. This really helps protect your reputation, gives you time to get over any feelings that might come up. <laughs> And feelings are a thing in project management. I mean, you can, to some extent, learn to manage your feelings. And there are lots of books on this, and I put one of them on the handout. So um, just, you know, you don't have to be a robot, but having a cool demeanor, people do love that. I can't say I always do, but um, it's something I strive for. And last but not least, if you're not going to be a project manager, but you find yourself working with one, here's the best advice I can give you. Stick to all your schedule and deliverable commitments. But if you can't, then let the project know before the project manager know in advance before your due date comes and goes that you need to work out an alternative schedule and then really have a realistic new date in mind. And usually a project manager will appreciate that so much that she will cheerfully uh, accept the change in schedule. So that's it. Do you have questions for me? I've, I've gone over by three minutes. Anybody have any remaining lingering questions? I, I have a question. Four minutes on here. So, uh, Lisa, is there with respect to um, getting people to do influencing without having any authority? Is are there times when you are forced to go over their head to the person who does have authority and say, "Hey, make this person do this thing"? Yes. And how do you and how do you deal with how do you deal with that in terms of like getting them pissed off? Uh, it's more that you might like my manager right, right now, I can say to him, I think this might mean more coming from you than it does from me. Yeah. And then he can just sort of finesse the request. Um, he is very conscious of how to not piss people off. And I, I think that it's in the manager's hands. It's in the, 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 the sponsor's hands to not to not make people mad. It's really not in your hands. But uh yeah choose your battles wisely when it comes to escalating like that um but there are just times when you need to to bring out you know that piece of the arsenal yeah thanks mm -hmm. jason have you formulated your question or can you just say topic wise what you were thinking i wanted to ask have you found yourself in situations where you kind of needed to uh, finesse, as you said, uh, your way out of it. Like when you said not to commit to an immediate change that someone prevents during the meeting. I can almost hear it. I heard you say, you asked, have I found myself in a situation where I need to finesse? Can Kelly, can you maybe repeat? Yeah, so um, it's, this is with regards to when you were talking about, uh, you know, kind of being caught off guard at a meeting and giving your, you know, not immediately committing. And, you know, what are strategies I think that you that you can use to, you know, buy yourself time in addition to um, in addition to saying, I want to think about it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can say that you've got a lot of 
of dependencies that you need to work through and you want to give a careful and thoughtful answer that takes into account all of these all of the all of the other the, the big picture that you're trying to manage and usually people will 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 accept that because just the mere thought of all the details you're trying to manage kind of makes them feel a little nauseous so um i think that they they will usually back off at that point and see how reasonable it is to ask for a few days. Any other questions? All right, thank you. You know what, let's give Lisa a virtual round of applause. Oh, thank you so much. And we really appreciate it. Um, and. Uh, thank you to everyone who joined us remotely. And again, we'll post the recording and make it available to everyone. Um, so that's the end of our program for the day. So thank you so much. Excellent. Best of luck to you all. And thanks for listening and being a great audience. Take care. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye. Okay. All right.